All right, John chapter number 4. We got down through verse 22 last time in an overview, but we're going to go back up and pick up a couple of points and some details and then uh, hopefully get through verse 23 with that information and then we'll uh, start up in verse 24. Uh, the Lord is talking here with the Samaritan woman. Um, last time we just got the flow and the overview. Uh, tonight I just get some of the details here back up and starting in verse number 9. But I'll just remind you, he's sitting there at Jacob's well. Uh, he's waiting for her. She comes. She comes at the not the normal time to draw water. She's up at noon. They usually draw water in the after, in the evening hour, uh, in the evening. And when they draw, so she's coming to avoid the women. And the women are probably glad she is so they don't have to deal with her because she's got a reputation, five husbands, and she's living with a guy that's not her husband, so all of this. But as the Lord deals with the woman from Samaria, he deals with her differently than he did with Nicodemus. With Nicodemus, with the religious crowd, he shut him up, he shut him down, and he just dealt. With her, it's a little more kit gloves with her. Uh, verse 9 I, well, verse 7, Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And we, we looked at that last time. The reason for the Samaritans and the Jews and the riff isn't a racial divide or it's, it's a family argument because they're all cousins, but it's a religious issue, and it's an issue of where they're worshiping. And Samaria got pulled off in uh, the northern ten tribes, that's what we're, where we're talking about. They're pulled off, and they've got Dan and Bethel and the competing religion, and the, the Jews down south, they know that where they're supposed to be at Jerusalem, that that's where we're supposed to be, and those guys up there, they've been literally carried off into satanic apost um, apostates. So, there's, that's why the riff. No, not so much, well, you're just uglier than I, and we don't like you, and you stink, you know. And it's not that. It, it's not a cultural thing. It's, it's a religious issue. And she, he asked her to give him drink. So the Lord just broke a couple social rules. One, he spoke to a woman in public he did not know. You're not supposed to do that in the day. And two... She's a woman of Samaria, and you don't talk to them either. So when the Lord says, give me drink, and she says, How, why are you asking me? You're not even supposed to be talking to me. Okay? So the, the Lord wasn't very religious. He wasn't very politically correct. She, and, and honestly, she doesn't know what's going on here. She, she just sees the guy. He's a Jew. She recognizes him as a Jew and says, hey, what are you doing talking to me? You're not... And he's like, well, Jesus answered and said, verse 10, he's going to have a conversation with her. Now, I'll remind you of verse 8, his disciples have left. They've gone into town to buy food. We, I said last time to you, he's offering her a gift, a free gift. His disciples are off in town buying something. Instead of their receiving the free gift as well, they're over here doing something else. And when actually when they come back, verse 27, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou or why talkest I mean, thou her with her? <laughs> they come back and they go, Lord, what are you doing talking to her? You know. So they're off doing something else. He has a private conversation with her. By the way, in this conversation, there are no miracles done. He doesn't wham-zam, you know, fill up the well or anything like that. He doesn't change the water to wine or the wine to water or any of that. It's just him talking with her because he's going to set something up here in verse 10 with her. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water." And now, the, as the Lord begins to deal with her, there's something deeper going on here than just that physical, get the drinking water up out of the well. 
And you'll notice that he says to her, if thou knewest the, the what? The gift of God. He said, talks about, he's going to talk about living water. Verse 12, he'll talk there at the end, thou hast that living water. The woman asked about it. Verse 13, he says, whoever drinks of this water, the well water, is going to do what? Get thirsty again. Verse 14, what's he going to say? Hey, the water I'm going to give you, you'll never thirst, you'll have that everlasting life. See, so he says to her in verse 10, if you first of all understand that I'm the giver, and the item that I'm giving you is a gift, then you would have been asking me. Now, who is he? He's the Messiah. Who is she? She is a lost sheep of the house of Israel, is who she is. She's a Samaritan, but she represents, he, he, he keeps calling her a woman. Woman. Mary was called woman. Mary represents Israel in the seed line and the blessing that's coming from the Messiah. Woman, she represents the, the apostate people who are then going to receive the blessing from the Messiah, the light. See, there's that, remember, remember, kind of we've been through that, the correlation there. So when he looks at her, he's looking at her not as, oh, you old stinky Samaritan, get out. He's looking at her, hey, here's a picture of the condition of, of Israel as a whole. And, and actually, when we get down next time into, um, through, and actually, when we get down into verse 25 and following and the rest of the conversation that he has with her, she, literally, she, as a representation of the people, they are, uh, they are ready to receive the message. And the disciples aren't ready. Jerusalem, he's just left Jerusalem. They're not ready. They've rejected him. Judea has rejected him, chapter 2, chapter 3. They've rejected him. The disciples haven't quite caught on to what's going on yet. And yet here's this lady. She's going to hear about this gift of God. Believe him. No miracles. Run home. Tell her whole town. The whole town, come, come and see the Messiah. And that's a picture early in the Lord's ministry of Samaria is ready. Jerusalem is the problem. They're not ready. Because where are they to go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. See that? Samaria is ready. They're pro he's, by the way, he's on his way to Galilee. You know, he's going to go up and call out and start fulfilling the, prophet, the, the scriptures there and Isaiah and stuff about how he comes out of Galilee and he brings the light and the darkness and all that and, and back in Matthew there and so forth. And he's beginning to do that. Verse 10, the issue here is this issue of giving the gift of God. If you'd have known what was going on here, this is more than just physical drinking water. If you'd have known who I was, and then the gift that I'm bringing you, which is living water, then you would have asked me for the drink, rather than me asking you. See, she thought she was the giver and the doer, and he's sitting there going, no, I'm the giver. Now, with Nicodemus, you know what he said? Don't you know you got to be born again? And oh, well, by the way, you can't do it. See, Nick, come, Lord, what, Rabbi, what do we do? What do we do? This woman comes, she has nothing to offer. She comes up and says, why are you asking me to get you water, you know? <laughs> I don't have anything for you. And yet, she's ready. So the the... The issue here now that's going to happen in, in, in the following verses here is he's going to take away the, the physical thinking that she has and move it now to the deeper issue of who he was as provider and what was he providing? Living water, everlasting life. And he's going to take her now, and, and, and again, she thought she was going to do the giving. And, and you know, what... She needed was him to be the giver. And he's going to walk her through that now. So, verse 10, he asked her the question, Give, uh, if, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto her, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, 
and the well is deep, from whence thou from whence then hast thou that living water? I mean, see how she's t- thinking about the well and drawing and the physical apparatus of everything? Art thou greater? Now watch it, verse 12. She, by the way, she doesn't understand what he's talking about yet. <laughs> you know, she's thinking about the... If, if, if you'd have said living water to her like he did, she's not thinking about well water. She's thinking about running water, water that runs. The law is real clear. If you're going to wash something, you're going to do this. You go over and you run it. You get it under running water, living water, movement. At the bottom of the well, what is there usually? A stream or something moving and everything, okay? The point is that she's thinking about the physical apparatuses. So she begins to say something to him here in verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his father. You know what she did? She went right to religion, didn't she? She didn't understand. Jacob, our father, where they're at Jacob's well, and we looked at Jacob's well, and there's those uh, half a dozen or so wells in Scripture. The first three begin to paint the picture, and the the others, after Genesis 24, begin to lay out stuff there. And, and the wells there, she's claiming her descendancy, my father, our father Jacob. And Jesus said, answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. That's not what I'm talking about, lady. I'm not talking about Jacob and the well and this water right here. Because if you keep drinking of that, you're just going to keep doing what? Being thirsty. Now, think about the religious context that she's claiming and pulling in, the descendancy issue. What's he saying? If you participate in that old vain religion over there, you're still going to be thirsty. Because in a minute, when we get down into 1920 and so forth, she brings it in again, and he shuts her down because her question in a minute is going to be, well, you say worship in Jerusalem. We say worship in Mount uh, Gerizan over here. Whose religion is right? And he's going to tell her, neither one are right, because here comes the new covenant. Okay, see, he's bringing in, he's bringing some things to light here with her. She's not clued in yet in verse 13. Verse 14, but whatsoever, I'm sorry, for, but, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, notice, in him. Where is it located? In him. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, she's thinking about this water that, you know, and he goes, you'll keep thirsting of that, but the stuff that I'm here to give you, that I'm to put into you, it's going to give you everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, what? Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She's almost there. (laughs) She's still, she's just on the bubble. Now, the issue of the living water, by the way, in Scripture, everlasting and eternal are different. Everlasting has a beginning with no end. Eternal has no beginning and no end. The eternal God He is not the everlasting God. He's the eternal God. Okay? The verse back in Psalms, I think it is, calls him God who is eternal. Now, how you know that is in Colossians 1, I think it's about verse 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 in there, where he's before all things and by him all things consist. So eternal and everlasting are are really, there's a beginning in everlasting. And by the way, where is the beginning of the everlasting life? It's with Him, with Messiah. So, I'm sorry? Exactly. Okay, so the living water here is going to be water that's going to produce everlasting life. And in verse 10, it's described as the gift of God. So God's going to provide the gift of eternal life or everlasting life, and it's going to be a gift. It's going to be in a form of living water. Now, come back with me to Jeremiah. 
chapter 2. This notation or bringing up of living water. She would instantly understand what he, an Israelite would instantly understand what he's talking about because it's very, it's, it's all really all through the Old Testament. Jeremiah 2 and verse number 12 and 13. Jeremiah 2, 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the foundation of living waters, and hewed them out of cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Notice how the Lord descri- he, he describes himself here as the foundation of living water. And what did they do? They got broken cisterns. Basically, they have left the Lord, haven't they? The the source of of the living water they left, they forsook, they went back to Baal worship and back where they were. If you come over to chapter 17 of Jeremiah, just so, so you see this issue about the living water, it's something that they would have uh, should have, I should say they not would have been, but they should have been familiar with. And we understand that when the Lord asked Nicodemus, you are a master in Israel and you don't know these things, <laughs> that there was some Bible dumbbells going on <laughs> there as well at that time. Jeremiah 17, verse number 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the foundation of living waters. And I'll remind you the capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah, that's Jehovah the Son, and they who have they forsaken? They've forsaken Jehovah. They're forsaking the Messiah. So So who is he? When the Lord stands there dealing with this woman at the well, he's standing there as the foundation of living waters. So he's able to give that gift of the living waters that are going to spring up. Come back to John there, John John, uh, 7, John 7, that are going to spring up into him and to bring them into eternal life. By by the way, on your way to 7, stop there at 4. When he talks there about, in verse 14, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life, he's talking about the restoration of Israel into her kingdom. He's talking about the Messiah coming, producing eternal life, kingdom life for that nation. Now, how that's accomplished is being described for you in John 4 as a well, as a living water springing up. See that? So the question then gets, well, and John 7 is going to help us here about this issue about who the living water is and, and really what the Lord is getting out there to this woman of Samaria. John 7, verse 37. In the last days, that great day of the Spirit, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and what? And drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Notice that. He's in Jerusalem, and he says, look, if you believe on me, Jeremiah calls me the foundation of living waters, what's going to happen? It's going to flow rivers of living water. Now watch verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So when he talks about living waters and rivers of waters, and who's he really talking about? He's talking about the Spirit. He's talking about this Spirit, the Spirit that's going to be come, this living water that's coming from the Lord. Okay, he's is the going to be that he calls the another comforter when the comforter comes. 
See, 39, the parentheses helps you begin to kind of piece some of this together because what's the Lord establishing into the little flock, into the believing remnant in Israel? The issue of the law and the prophets were until John. Since John, the kingdom is preached and every man presses into that, okay? There's an issue of the old covenant is going away into the new covenant, and who's, bringing, who, who's the main worker in the new covenant, if you remember Jeremiah 31? It's the Spirit. What's He going to do? He's going to come in. He's going to justify them. He's going to sanctify them. He's going to write His laws in their hearts. They're going to be His people. They're going to be His God. They get the land. That's that working of the Spirit in them. Well, here in John, they don't have the Spirit yet. And... <laughs> And when we studied the Spirit, I told you, the Spirit in the Old Testament doesn't work the same as He does today. He goes in, He goes, you know, Saul had an evil spirit and different things, ha- you know. It's not the same. So in John 4 and John 7, the Holy Spirit coming is a future event. Now in Acts 2, what happens? He comes. Acts 14, he'll tell, I'm sorry, in John, come over to Acts 2. In John 14, he says, I got to go away so that the Comforter will what? Will come. So in Acts 1 and Acts 2, we have the day, we need Acts 2. We have the day of Pentecost, and who comes? The Holy Spirit comes. And you, you know the story. They think they're drunk, they think they're off their rocker, and Peter's got to come in and and deal with them there in verse 15, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he begins to inform the audience who are all the Jews out of every known country of the world in the day. And he says, look, what you're seeing is Joel being fulfilled. Now come over to verse Well, verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up and having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden. You guys just, you just, with wicked hands, you, you you murdered the Messiah. Now watch verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, by the way, David held all three offices. He's the only man to ever do that. He was a king, a priest, and a prophet. He held all three, and God didn't kill him. (laughs) Now, God takes care of Saul when he tried that, but God didn't do that because David is the man after God's heart. He's that type, that picture, the whole thing there, okay? Um, We know he's a king. The verse 30 calls him a prophet. He's the priest when he offers the, the, the um, the sacrifice. He stands in for the priest when he's on the run from Saul, and they have to do, okay? If you ask me later, I'll try to figure, remember where that's at. That's good? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this being, verse 30, Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So David says, back there in Psalms, It's talking about the resurrection of the Lord, right? Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all our witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Notice verse 33. Therefore, Because of the resurrection of Christ, Peter begins is explaining that what they are seeing out there on the day of Pentecost, all that speaking in tongues and everything, is the proof to Israel 
that Christ was resurrected and exalted to the right hand of the, of the Father. That's your proof text, guys. You want to know what's going on? The guy you killed with wicked hands has just been exalted to his rightful position. Okay? And, oh, by the way, it's a testimony. To you, we are, the witnesses, the testimony about the fact that his resurrection and set at the right hand has been accomplished just as he said he would. And what did he tell us? He says, I'm going to go away, and when I go, I'll send the Comforter. And guess what? Now the Comforter is here. Now it's time for, now they have their, 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 they're receiving the capacity now, okay, to inaugurate, to begin that issue, the, the new covenant issue. Now, if you think about what's going on here, John, said, John is the fourth of the gospel, of the gospel set. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can begin to stack them together and mirror, uh, they call it the synopsis, okay? John, we can't really do a lot of that with because John wasn't designed to, do, to, to kind of fit with that. It doesn't leave stuff out. There's only eight miracles in John. Well, he did a whole bunch more, but there's only eight of them, and they're eight there for a reason, and it's to produce... The, the indictment really against Israel that, hey, he, he, was the, he was deity. So what is he doing here? In his earthly ministry as he goes along, what does the Lord know? The Lord knows that the old covenant is going away, doesn't he? But he knows that the old covenant doesn't die until he dies. So if you know the old computer system's going out, we were talking about earlier, and the new one's coming on, won't you be having meetings about the new system that's coming on board, even while you're using the old? Follow that? That's what the Lord is doing, and you see it in John more clearly than you do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because in John, what's he doing? He's talking to the Samaritan woman here, talking about living waters and the Holy Ghost coming, and when the Holy Spirit comes, we're going to have a new covenant, we're going to have this, blah, 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 you know, and he's laying all that out for her. And she gets it, believes it, and woohoo, let's go. But what's he, what's he doing with his people? He's laying in the doctrines, the Hebrews over there. I always, interesting, he says, we're not going to go back and lay the doctrines of Christ again. I'm like, the doctrines of Christ? You know, you think about that. So you go back, well, where would that have been where he would have spoke? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And what do you see him doing? Fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, but he's also doing what? Setting in the new covenant. And the writer of Hebrews says, all that information has been set in. We're not going to go back over that again. You go study it. You go get it. We're going to move on to perfection now. We're going to move on that, see? So come, come back to Isaiah 44. So in the Old Testament... The Isaiah 44, when you talk about, in the Old Testament, the New Covenant, I mean, I know we go to Jeremiah 31 and we go to Ezekiel 36, but you also see it in other places. And when you talk about the, old, the, the New Covenant, not the Old, the issue is clearly shown about the, about the operation of the Holy Spirit that's there. Again, Saul... He had the Spirit work on him and then leave him. Samson, think about Samson and Delilah. Samson, he had the Spirit until Delilah cut his hair. Then the Spirit left. Then when it grew back, the Spirit came back so he could bring the house down. David, he had the Spirit. And even when he sinned, he cries, don't take, you know, the, the great passage where he says, don't take the Holy Spirit away from me. Evidently, when you look at the record a little closely, David really never lost the Spirit because he always did what God said to do. He always went back to Nathan. He always obeyed God's Word. Now, I, don't, I can't say that, he, that it did or didn't. It just seems to me that if Paul quotes in Romans 4, Blessed is the man into whom the Lord will not impute sin, that takes a Holy Spirit involvement to understand that and for him to be able to say that. 
you know. So anyway, Isaiah 44, verse number 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and that Jeshurun whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. Notice how he says, I'm going to pour, my, I'm going to pour water on you, and then I'm going to pour my spirit on you. They're interact, the, 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 there's, a, there's a comparison there. And there's a blessing that's going to come. That's back there. Now we're back in John 4, 14. Hey, you drink of this, we got, you're, you're, you're covered. Come back over to chapter 32. By the way, I will pour out, I will pour the water upon you. That's exactly what Jeremiah 30, verse 3, 44, 1, 2, and 3. The uh, Jeremiah 31, you know what he says? I'll put my spirit in you. I'll pour this out. What did Joel 3 say? Joel 2, Joel 3, what? Is happening there. Hey, when this happens, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon the people and on the young men, and the, you know, they're going to do the prophesying and so forth. Isaiah 32, chapter 32, and verse number one. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes, princes shall rule in judgment. Now, a king's going to reign, so who's that going to be? That'll be the Lord. Uh, he'll They'll resurrect David and Ezekiel and put David up at the head. But the princes, back in chapter 1, he's already told them, I will reestablish all your judges, all your princes. The princes, by the way, are going to be replaced by the 12 apostles sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 out there in the kingdom. So we're talking here about him establishing his government in, in Israel, in, in, in Israel being his government in the earth and so forth. Watch verse 13. 32.13, Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city, because the palaces shall be forsaken. The multitude of cities shall be left, the forts and the towers shall be for dens forever, a joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. Pretty tough when they forsook God, didn't they? Because then what did God do? He forsook them. That's what you're reading in 13 and 14. Until, verse 15, first word. Until what? The Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Until Acts 2 happens. Until that Spirit is poured out. Verse 16. Then... Judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting place. Hey, what's coming up? What happens after the Spirit's poured out? The kingdom comes in. Judgment takes place. That 70th week of Daniel, and then who's there? The kingdom is in. But the coming of the Holy Spirit is associated with the redeeming of Israel, the regathering of Israel, the new covenant coming in. See that? By the way, just kind of on a cul-de-sac move. Verse 17, the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, what? Quietness and assurance. When we were studying in 2 Thessalonians, and he said I tell, I, at the end there in chapter 3 about being quiet and study to be quiet, tells them the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 4. Where does that quietness come from? It comes from righteousness. And Philippians 1, for you and I in the body, says that the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So where do we get our righteousness, and where do we get our peace 
and our quietness and everything. It's by who we are in Him. See, all that begins to... It's the same thing for Israel, though. And that's the point He's driving at with the woman, okay? Yeah, exactly. We have it now, and they have to wait for it. And, and that is a big key that a lot of people miss, is that key. Because they think they got it instantly. And it's because the then... Then the Holy, until the Holy Spirit's poured out, God's forsaken us. He, now, we, now we're down the road. Chapter 12 of Isaiah. Chapter 12, verse 1. Again here, about the, the kingdom and their joy in the Lord. And in uh, uh, Isaiah 12, verse 1. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation." There's, they're drawing with, with what? With joy. What are they going to do? They're going to go over to the well, and they're going to draw out. I, I love that he calls it that well of salvation. In our men's fellowship last month, we were talking about justification and salvation, and they are different definitions to them. Most people knee-jerk react and say justification unto eternal life, and that's, but not every time justification shows up in Scripture does that, is that the definition. All right, when we looked at like 12 or 11 or 12 different illustrations of that. But salvation is the same thing. Most of the time people talk about salvation from the, from the penalty of sin and from death and hell, but salvation isn't always that in Scripture. The well of salvation here isn't for them having their sins forgiven and so forth. It's for them being what? Delivered into the kingdom. See? They, they've been under some struggle. <laughs> you got chapter 10, verse 5, the rod of my indignation is on them. <laughs> and and my, he's my strength. I'm going to relax in who I am in him, and I'm going to allow him to come. So I'm with joy. I'm going to come over here and talk about and, and, and draw water out of him. So he's talking to the woman at the well. By the way, whose well again? Jacob's well. Not to be lost in all of this. The place where Jacob bought the land, dug the well, fought off the enemies, deeded it through inheritance to Joseph so he would have a double inheritance for the two boys. And then when Joseph died, what did they do? It became a cemetery. <laughs> they buried, buried his bones there. He's talking to that woman at that well, and you know what he says? He says, you know what? I've been in Jerusalem. They rejected me. I had to clean their temple up again. See that? And he says, you know what? One day, I'm going to clean up this well, and it's going to be a well of salvation. It's interesting. He's talking to the woman about this. Living waters. Again, about the Holy Spirit, eternal life. You're in Isaiah. Come over to chapter 49. Isaiah 49. And all of this about the living waters, it has to do with the accomplishment of the new covenant. He's laying in the foundational doctrinal treatise of the New Covenant and what's happening. And he says, Isaiah 49, oh, where'd he go? Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritage, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all the high places. 
talking about the restoration of Israel. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Look at that. So in John 4, and come back over there, he went back into the Old Testament, brought in all this information, begins to lay out for her this issue of living water, what it is and what's going on. And you know what she does in verse... Well, look at the right verse. <laughs> verse 14, verse 15, what'd she say? I'll take it. <laughs> Let me have that good stuff that you just, that gift you're talking about, I got it. Let me have it. So now watch verse 16. Now you'd think the Lord would say, great, welcome to the family. It's wonderful. Woohoo, happy, how you doing? Whoa, he doesn't say that at all, does he? He says, go call thy husband and come hither. Ooh, whoops, back to reality. And the woman answered and said, verse 17, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest, in that saidest thou truly. Ooh, ouch. There's something odd there when he asked that, by the way. And we looked at it last time in greater detail. I'll just remember, remind you of what he said to her in verse 16. What did he say to her? Go call thy husband and come thither. Go out into your life, gather it all up, and bring it back to me. That's what he's telling her. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. He goes, I know, you got five of them. Now, that's the only supernatural thing in the whole context right there is that he could tell her he, know, he knows everything. Okay? Because, And by the way, she's going to go back and report and tell them, hey, come see the guy that, that told stuff that I didn't tell him. <laughs> but go get your life. I'll get you, I'm going to give you the water that you, that you need. But what I need you to do is bring me your entirety to me. Five husbands. She's down drawing water at noonday. Doesn't want to be the shame with the women. You know, the women at the well, you know, hey, hey, there's, you know, she, five of them, man. Oh, my goodness. And she's living with the guy, you know, the shame. Now, she's of Samaria. She's used to that gossip, but these are her people talking about her, you know. <laughs> he go, Come back. That's grace. That's what, what, what you're seeing here is what in verse one when he, in chapter one when he says, "Grace and truth came by Jesus, by Jesus came grace and truth." What you're seeing is grace. He didn't zap her. He didn't knock her down. He didn't stone her for adultery or fornication or any of that, or living in sin. He just said, "What? I'll give you the water. Go bring me your life, though. There's a thirst that needs to be quenched by her. She's been bouncing from man to man. There's, a, <laughs> there's something going on in her that she needs what? To be satisfied. In modern day psychobabble, it's called happiness. Everybody's wanting to be happy. You know, and it's like, he's like, go, I'll, I'll take care of your thirst. I'll, I'll satisfy your need. It's in me. It's sitting right here. Come, go, bring it back to me. And again, that gift, that's a gift of grace right there. Because he could have easily just said, all right, Father, get her. He had the law to back him up on it. But he doesn't do that. Verse 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She's impressed. But... She's going to play the religious card now. And honestly, when you think about people naturally, when they're convicted, he's pricked her pretty good here. Got her under some conviction. Where do most people run? To a safe place called religion. They really, 
Change the subject. Move. Get away, right? Yeah. They, she ran right back to, watch her verse 20. Our fathers worshiped <laughs> in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Our fathers. So look at our father. He, she's setting up the contest here. I realize that you're a prophet because you're telling me things that I never told you, and there's something, spe- you know, something weird going on here. But I'm our fathers. Don't you know? Who do you think you are? We're here at Jacob's well. You know, he sat here. He ate here. He, you know, hey, there's his table and chair. You know, all the, they got it. And he, he, that, and by the way, that is the great question that usually comes up: which religion is right? Now, it's no problem for Jesus to answer him, and he's going to now in the following verses. But in this mount, and in that mount, you see, there was things going on there back in Genesis. And we got a few minutes. Go back to Genesis 22. We might not make verse 23. That's okay. Genesis 22. <coughs> When she turns to the Our Father thing, she's trying to turn to anywhere but Christ. She's, she's playing that. I, there's something not right. I want what you're talking about, but what you're telling me, I, I'm, not, I, I'm still over here, okay? 22.1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou hast, lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him therefore burnt offerings upon one of the mountains which I will tell of thee. So what's Abraham going to do with Isaac? They're going to load up, they're going to go to the land of Moriah, and they're going to find a mountain, and the Lord will tell him. Come over, come down to verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said in this to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So That place is so special that what did Moses do? He named it. I mean, Abraham do. He named it, didn't he? And he named it Jehovah Jireh, one of the one of the compound names there of the of Jehovah. Now come over to Second Chronicles, chapter three. It's the mountain of the Lord. In the mountain of the Lord. By the way, that's the. Jehovah name, Jehovah Jireh, the, the Lord will provide. Second Chronicles 3, and watch verse number 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount what? Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of, or are in the Jebusite, and off they go, right? You see that Mount of Moriah? It's all the same mountain. It's the mount that Abraham was at. It's the mount where David sat. It's all this stuff. And he's talking about Jerusalem in Second Chronicles 3. That's what he's talking about, because where did Solomon build it? In Jerusalem, the city of the great king. So when she pulls this little card in this mountain and in that mountain, you say worship in this and that, well, Deuteronomy 27 had already told them that three times a year you're going to go down to Jerusalem and worship. You go here. Jeroboam, he says, no, you don't need to go there. Why would you go to a church on the other side of town? when they got one right here in the neighborhood. And he sets it up in Dan and in Bethel in the north and in the south. And what happens is, is then she, so she's pulling out a, the religion card. Now, go back to John 4. We've got to go real quick here. Verse 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, Believe me. I mean, he has no problem answering her. Now watch how he answers her. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what we know. I'm sorry. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father, where? In spirit and in 
truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. You see, His answer to her is where you're worshiping down there in that hilltop and really where they're worshiping down in Jerusalem is nothing but vain apostate religion. And there's going to come a day, and I'm going to tell you the days right now, even though it's going to, okay, old covenant, new covenant, we got kind of running at the same time here a little bit. You have no idea what's coming your way. Salvation is of the Jews. That's always been the case. But what I need you to understand is, is we're not, you're not worshiping in the building anymore. You're worshiping where? In spirit and in truth. See? Why? Because I'm going to give you, John 14, another comforter. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. We're establishing and setting in the new covenant. And he, st- he begins to, and, and again, the issue of worship, uh, we started Sunday a, a little series on music. And when we get into it a little bit more, we'll find out that worship isn't really... Look at where that says. They're going to worship the Father where? In spirit and in truth. It's not in the music program. (laughs) But it is in the... Well, he took them off the board. The Psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs. We identified those out last time, last Sunday. See, he's the Lord here with her, there's going to come... There's an hour that's coming that no one is going to worship down there in the apostate Samaria or in apostate Jerusalem. Where are they going to worship? In the Spirit and in truth. Now, they do worship in Jerusalem because that's where the city of the great king is and the kingdom's going to be established. But he's not talking about in that city. He's talking about in that apostasy, in that apostate setup. Follow that? What's going on there? His answer is clear and concise. You're worried about a building, and I'm telling you it ain't the building. I'm telling you it's over here in the Spirit now. Now, we were worshiping in a building because that's what the Old Covenant was all about, the temple and the tabernacle and everything. But all that's an apostasy, and I'm establishing something new with you, living waters, everlasting life, and it's going to take care, and it's going to be done and accomplished not in a building, but now in people. And that's where he talks there about the true worshipers. See that? He's talking now in people. And the issue there in verse 23 is, you got to, I can just see the Lord. Honey, you got to catch on to what I'm saying here. (laughs) You know, because again, there's that overlap of the old going on. That, and by the way, that's why he says that the hour cometh, it's coming. But the hour cometh and now is. The end of the old covenant is going to happen with what? When Hebrews, when he, the death of the testator, now we have the new. But I'm laying in the foundation so that when I'm dead and gone and you know out of here and the spirit comes, that new just takes off. And again, he's not saying that they won't worship in Jerusalem, because obviously they do. But they're not going to worship in that apostate system that's down there running the show right now. And the people of the new covenant won't come to a place to worship. They come to God to worship. Now, when you think about the place versus God, the, the place is Jerusalem, the city. But who's in the city when they come and worship in the kingdom? Christ is. He's there. So in the millennial, the the place is important, but it's important not because it's a place, but it's because the life that draws everybody is in the place. Does that make sense? It's kind of like with us. We meet at the building at Mitchell and 10th. When we're all when when I'm here by myself in the daytime studying and working, it's lonely. I got the radio on. I got the, uh, Why? Because there's no life in here. But on Sunday, Wednesday night, guess what? When we're all here, guess what? There's a lot of life going on. And that's the idea. The hour cometh. The hour, it's now is coming. And again, he knows the old covenant is coming to, which by the way, that's what she's, all of her references are to is the old covenant. And he's bringing in the new. 
And that really begins the reason why then in verse 24 he's going to say, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we'll get into all that next time. I want you to see just real quick, because next time we'll get into verse 24, look down at verse 25, just real quick. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is come, which is called Christ. When he come, when he has come, he will tell us all things. Now notice her response to his critiquing of his answer to her religious question. Her response is what? I got it. I got you. I hear you. Okay? Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She got it. Pretty clear. Now, Nicodemus, he was clear, but he wasn't as simple as that to Nick, I don't think. Nicodemus, he gets it eventually, but see... When the woman hears the answer to the religious question about, look, it's not in the building down there, it's not in the place, it's in you, and this is new, and the things that are coming and so forth, she goes, he's coming and I need him. Verse 25, and verse 26, he says, I'm here. Now watch verse 27. And upon, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. They, they show up and go, what are you doing talking to this woman? Yet no man said. Now look at what they did not ask. What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? What did he tell the woman at the well? If you knew who I was and what I'm bringing, you'd ask me to be the provider, the giver. Notice that the disciples didn't even ask, they didn't ask, what are you do- what's going on here? And Lord, why are you talking to her? See, they didn't even ask that. They just marveled that he's talking to a woman. They're not quite ready to be clued in yet. Now, they, they get there, but here, here early, they're not. They're, they're just kind of bumping along. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And again, that great tri- trumpet of come and see, come and see, that we see all through the Gospels. So anyway, we'll pick up in verse 24 because God is a spirit, and that, those things are, we, we have to ha- kind of hammer some, out, some things out about the Godhead and so forth that are interesting side notes, if you'll let me say it that way, but yet are very critical in that why in the world would the Lord be saying that? To her, because that's who he's talking to. And that's an interesting little end too. So we'll be a couple weeks in verse 24, because we don't we're already on an hour. So okay. But the woman on the well is she's a neat lady. And at the end, by the way, they come and see her and they go home and they the whole city is turned. Okay? All right, very good. Dear Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the study. We thank you for the look into the word here that we have, that we can see. We can come and see how you handled your people when you walked on the earth and how you will do for them in the future. And we can rejoice in all that you've done for us in the now, in the present. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.